If we begin, we've been requested to recite Dua Shafa for a sister in India who is going for an operation tomorrow. For all of our murid around the world, and as we mentioned yesterday, there are still problems for our brothers in Syria, especially in the Sayyidah Zainab area. So inshallah, we pray for all of those who are in need around the world. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه يكشف السوء 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 الله سبحانه وتعالى. For the love of our awaited Savior, Imam al-Hajj, one last salawat. Allah سبحانه وتعالى. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله للظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد قال إمام الحج عليه السلام اللهم إني أفتتح الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للصواب بمنك وأيكنت أنك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع العفو والرحمة سلوات Awaited Savior, Imam Zamana, my respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amongst the greatest actions specified within the holy month of Ramadan is the supplication. To continuously perform du'a, supplicating towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our very different kinds of needs throughout the day. When it comes to this specific supplication within Shah Ramadan, the emphasis can be seen by how many different types of supplication are recommended within this month. And how we see that there is a formulation, a difference of type of supplication that is recommended within Shah Ramadan. For example, we see that when we begin our fast, we are given a supplication. When we open our fast, we are given a supplication. At the end of our salah, there is a different supplication. There is a different supplication for each of the ten nights as we end the holy month itself. And therefore you can see by virtue of so many different supplications, and how often we are recommended to recite these different supplications, there is a huge and specific emphasis on the A within this particular month. And therefore it formulates part and parcel of the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within Shah Ramadan as part of the fasting process, as part of the purification process that comes alongside the recitation of the Holy Quran, the additional prayers that we are supposed to pray, and therefore all of these things together formulate that direction towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This supplication process, this additional dua that we find that are given to us within this particular month, they serve a very specific purpose. There is a concept, a theory behind these different dua that are recommended within this month. The concept is that when we supplicate, 
We are in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are discussing with Him between myself, my soul, and Him being the all-listening creator and sustainer of this universe. And therefore, by virtue of my communication with Him, and by virtue of there being so many different types of supplication, I am communicating with Him about so many different things throughout this day. As we look within the different du'a that are given to us, I might be supplicating to Him, seeking istighfar. Or I might be supplicating to Him, telling Him of my needs. Or I'm supplicating, telling Him of my weaknesses. Or telling Him about my family. Or telling Him about the politics of the world. Every different type of situation that I could possibly need to converse with my Lord about, there is a du'a for. And specifically within this month, we are recommended to increase our supplication and we can see that by virtue of how much we are doing that. With this, the idea is that I'm constantly attracting Tawheed. The more I'm in communication with Him, the more I'm in remembrance of Him. And therefore the concept of being in this constant communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in order to ensure that I'm in a constant state of Tawheed. In that throughout my day, whether I am walking, whether I'm about to open my fast, whether I'm in an evening, whether I'm about to finish the recitation of Qur'an, I'm constantly in communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The resulting factor of this is to mold me for this particular month and therefore to continue to mold me for the rest of the year coming. What we mean by this is that many of our Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, have a synonymous tradition. They say to us that this particular month, the month of Ramadan, is the first month of the year. The first month of the year. But straight away we question and we say, well, Muharram is the first month of the year, and Safar is the second month of the year. How can we have traditions from our Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, saying that Shah Ramadan is the first month of the year? What they are trying to inculcate in us is that Shah Ramadan is the first spiritual month of the year. To the extent that our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa is narrated to have said, he who keeps away from sins in Shah Ramadan will be able to keep away from sins for the rest of the year. Hence, Shah Ramadan is the first, of the, is the first month of the year. The idea is that in this month, I mold myself to be that individual, that character that I want to be. So that as Shawwal begins, as the rest of the year continues, I have already reached that peak of myself within the year and continue on that person. Now here we need to contextualize what the Imam is saying in our time. Sometimes in our families at home or in ourselves, we choose to do something or choose to close off something in Shah Ramadan. For example, and we hear this many times within our families. For example, dad or mum or the elder of the family will say, in this month, don't watch certain types of films. Or you're not supposed to go here within this month. Or the youth will say, well, I'm putting in the effort. So for this month, I won't listen to music. Have you seen this within the family? Family specifically says, in Shah Ramadan, don't watch Indian films. Dad says, in this month is Shah Ramadan, so you need to make sure that you don't listen to music. Now here, it's brilliant from one perspective that we're inculcating the idea that in Shah Ramadan, I increase my spirituality. But on the other hand, when we begin to observe what we're really saying, there's a degree of hypocrisy in the same thing. I'm respecting the month of Ramadan, so therefore I will switch off a certain type of film, or I won't listen to a certain type of thing. But the moment Shawwal comes, you know what, it's okay, I'll put it back on again. Which one was greater, Shah Ramadan or the creator of Shah Ramadan? The creator is greater. Therefore, in our families, we have to break this mold of saying, in Shah Ramadan, I won't watch the Indian film. I won't listen to music. Oh, son of mine, don't listen to music in this month. It shouldn't be the statement in this month. It should be in Shah Ramadan. Learn how to be the individual you want to be for the whole year. If you are capable of switching off that particular film, and let's be honest, it happens within our community. 
Let's not say, why is he bringing this from the pulpit? It happens in our families. If you are capable in Shah Ramadan of switching off that kind of film, you are capable of switching it off for the entire year. If you are a person who abstains from listening to music or smoking or any physical, spiritual, emotional weakness in this month, the purpose of this month was to inculcate that so that you carry it through throughout the rest of the year. Hence our Ahlul Bayt say that this is the first month of the year. This is the first spiritual month of the year. When you practice, you practice for the entire year inshaAllah. Now with that, we see that Shah Ramadan is the peak of the year. There is nothing compared to Shah Ramadan. The blessings that we are sitting in now are incomprehensible. There is no way for you and I to tangibly understand what is happening in our souls, in the unseen realm. How much mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is flowing upon us at this very moment. It is greater than that mother who hasn't seen her child for so many months when he lands at the airport and she has her open arms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his open arms metaphorically saying, come towards me, O oh my son, O oh my creation. I am waiting for you to run into my open arms of mercy. The fact that Shah Ramadan is the greatest of month and the fact that this dua is emphasized so much in the month the idea is not to just finish in the next month coming in Shawwal, however much you have practiced to be in communion with your Lord. When you open a meal, you say to Him, thank you, because in this month you prepare yourself. When you open your meal, you say it. When you close your meal after Salah, you make your dua, carry this through because you are in communion with your Lord. The fact that Shah Ramadan is the peak of the month, we find that the preceding two months are the ones that help build us in preparation. Everything is geared towards this climax, this crescendo of the year. Rajab is preparing us for Sha'ban. Sha'ban prepares us for Shah Ramadan. What do we mean by this? As an example, in the months of Rajab and Sha'ban, there is clearly an emphasis on fasting. Fast. He who fasts one day within those months, hell is close to him. There's an emphasis, prepare yourself. For example, there is an emphasis in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban to perform ziyarah. We go towards Holy Karbala and there is such a level of emphasis of ziyarah to Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban. Why? It is preparing us to perform the ziyarah of the table of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we're building, we're preparing ourselves. In the same way, dua is also preparing us. In the month of Rajab, we had a specific dua we are recommended to recite every night. Ya dhul jalali wal ikram, ya dhul na'ma'i wal jood, ya dhul manni wal tawr, harrim shaybati ala nar. Every night, practice this one in Rajab. But then because Sha'ban is supposed to increase us, it's building the foundations towards Shah Ramadan. In Sha'ban, there is another dua to be recited. We have the Munajat of Sha'baniya. Imam al Khomeini alayhi rahma is narrated to have said, of all the duas, Munajat Sha'baniya is my favorite. Imagine what secrets must be within this particular dua. Rajab, building to Sha'ban. And therefore, if the holy month of Ramadan is the peak of all the months within the year, it must have the very best of dua within this particular month. And that is dua iftitah given to us by the awaited Savior and Imam of our time, Imam al Hajj Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif. If these are the best of nights and these are the best of days, we must have an equivalent du'a for this particular month. And that is the du'a of iftitah. Our scholars have reviewed this du'a time and time again. And they have verified it and stated that it is completely correct by their opinion. To the extent that they quote one tradition which says that the Imam narrates that he who recites du'a iftitah, the angels seek istighfar for that person on their behalf. Can you imagine when the angels take time away from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to seek istighfar for you and I? 
that must be a worship on behalf of us that they are doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To ask for our forgiveness. Dua iftitah, therefore, must be a dua that we consider to be of a huge rank to the extent that we could also and may also be reciting this dua outside of these particular nights of Shah Ramadan. The themes within it are universal. The concepts within it are ones that can be applied throughout the whole of the year. And therefore it is this recommendation that maybe once a month we can take time out to recite Dua Iftitah to remind ourselves what is the concept of what this Imam is trying to give us. Now here inshallah we have many of our elders and our youths who have been reciting Dua Iftitah every single year. And now Alhamdulillah Ta'ala we also have the translation of it as well. So we become accustomed to the words that the Imam, the treasures that the Imam is giving to us. In today's world, culture, society, we need to continue to build on what we have. We need to encourage our youth to ponder upon these verses. Not just to recite them beautifully, not just to be given awards because they recite them beautifully, but also we must recognize them when they have understood the value of the words therein. Because without understanding the value of the words therein, we are only reciting this particular da'a as a parrot. And therefore, inshallah, we encourage ourselves to really take the da'a home and ponder as to what the Imam is trying to tell us. Let us start with this question or these series of questions and ask ourselves what the Imam would be giving to us within this da'a. What we know, what facts do we know? Let us analyze the facts of this dua and see what questions we can come with. And then as we begin our commentary of dua iftita throughout the nights, we will come back to these very questions. This dua is given to us in Shah Ramadan. And therefore it must have a special relationship with this month. Our Imams, peace be upon them all, are in tune with the unseen realm. They understand Tawheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world and the next world for everything that it really is. And therefore when they give us a dua at any particular night or any particular occasion, it is specific to that particular occasion. Dua kumail is specific for the Thursday night. It doesn't mean you can't recite it outside, of course you can. Recite it as often as much as you want. But the reason as to why the commander of the faithful gave us this dua and specified to at least recite it once a week on this Thursday is because something in the unseen realm of Thursday night has a connection with the verses therein. Similarly, dua iftita is very specific. Why didn't the Imam give us this dua in Sha'ban? And why don't we recite Munajah Sha'baniya within Shah Ramadan? There must be a reason for this dua and its relationship within this particular month. And therefore every verse that you read, every verse that you read tonight and throughout the rest of your life, pose that question. Why did Imam say this line in context of Shah Ramadan? One. Two. If this dua is given to us by the Imam of our time, it must be that he has a relationship with this dua. Why didn't the commander of the faithful give us this dua? Did he not know about it? Of course he knew about it. Why didn't our fifth imam or our tenth imam give us this dua? Of course they knew about it. Why did our twelfth imam give us this dua? And therefore the fact that our imam is in ghayba for such a lengthy period, may Allah hasten his reappearance, there must be a relationship between the imam himself and this particular dua. And therefore, by virtue of there being a relationship between those two, we are obliged to understand it A, in context of ghaybah, but B, also in context of his reappearance, whenever that may be. And therefore, this is another question that we can pose every time we read a verse. My master, why would you say this? What relationship does it have towards you? And what relationship does it have towards Shah Ramadan? Sallallahu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The opening line of Dua Iftitah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjir farajahum bismillahir rahmanir rahim Allahumma inni aftatihu al-thana'a bihamdik Oh Allah, 
Allahumma inni, I begin. Allahumma inni aftatiha athana'a bihamdik. I begin by glorifying you and praising you. Or another way to translate this would be, I begin by glorifying you with praise. Allahumma inni aftatiha athana'a bihamdik. I begin this glorification through your praise. Now here inshallah, we want to spend the rest of the discussion focusing on this one word iftitah. Because in regards to the one word iftitah, it sets a precedent for every single feature of this particular du'a. And once we understand this one word iftitah and what it is truly saying to you and I, we will have an understanding of how the Imam sets the precedent of the remainder of the du'a. The du'a can be split into two. The scholars who write the commentary of this du'a and make comment, they suggest that the du'a can be split into two. The first half is a supplication and praise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is in regards to the relationship between us as creation and Him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second half of the du'a is in regards to our relationship and as a praise towards the divine leaders. But also an exposition upon what life should be and how we should be thinking in order to aid these particular divine leaders. So we have a praise for Allah and we have a praise for divine leadership. Interaction with Allah, interaction with divine leadership. And therefore this du'a is split into two. As we know, as a community, when we finish that salawat upon the awaited Savior, that is when we sit and we begin to address the Imam and we begin to speak about the facets of the world that we live in and what we want from His coming, how we want His governance to be, how we want the earth to be. And therefore the idea is for us to participate in that particular coming. Now when it comes to this, the word iftitah itself has its own measurement upon these particular features. The word iftitah follows an Arabic rule in the science of syntax. As you know, in Arabic, we have morphology and we have the syntax. We have sarf and we have naho. And one has to master these sciences before they're able to really understand what the Holy Quran is saying in accordance with the language, in accordance with jurisprudence, in accordance with all the different things that language is going to bear testimony to. In the science of syntax, there is a particular rule that this word iftitah follows. Ziyadatul mabadi tadullu ala ziyadatul ma'ani. The rule translated in syntax is the more letters that you have in a particular word, the more meaning it has to it. Yes? The more letters that the Arabic word has, the more meaning that this particular word has to it, the more depth that you can begin to extract from this particular word. Let me give you an example, and you will understand this very simply, this example, and then we'll apply it inshaAllah to the Holy Quran. When we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We know that the words ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim denote something very specific. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim come from the very same root word Rahma. They both mean mercy. But Ar-Rahman is different from Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is a very encompassing mercy. It is a mercy for everything and everybody in creation. Be you believer or disbeliever, polytheist or atheist, you are still encompassed within this particular mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahim however, is a specific type of mercy. It is the mercy for the believers, those who have strived hard, those who are worthy of being designated with a specific type of mercy. In this world and in the next, they are given that specific type of mercy. Now we know this because Quran shows us this. We know this because Ahl al-Bayt have told us this. But also, even if these two sources hadn't told us this, the Arabic rule of syntax, that the more letters you have, the more meaning there is to it. Ar-Rahman has five letters. Ar-Rahim has four letters. Therefore, by virtue of this principal rule, that if you have more letters to a particular word, you have a greater meaning. Ar-Rahman having five letters over four letters is more encompassing within itself. 
This is the principle of this rule. Let us apply this now towards the word iftitah and understand what the word iftitah actually means. Iftitah, we will translate Allahumma inni aftatihu. Oh my Lord, I begin. I begin praising you, glorifying you, my Lord. But it doesn't mean this. Only we say this in translation. But the reality of this is so much more. In the Arabic language, you have root words or root letters and additional letters. The root letters are called huruf al asliya and the additional huruf al mazida. In the word iftitah, the root letters are fataha. Fataha. Therefore, the additional letters, the additional alif and the additional ta to make iftitah are the huruf al mazida. They are the additional letters. And therefore, when you apply the additional letters, they add the value to the meaning. When you add these letters, it changes the context of the word. Instead of just saying, my Lord, I begin in your praise and glory, the additional two letters make this into a continuous tense, meaning that I continuously begin in praise of you, my Lord. There's never a time when I stop. I continuously praise you, my Lord. I never stop praising you. Let us see how this is in Quran and then re-review this within the word iftitah. There are two examples we want to present to you about this particular rule within the Holy Quran. The first one is within Surah Al-Hajarat, chapter number 49, verse number 9 of the Quran. It says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When, وَإِن طَائِفَطَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ when you see two groups from amongst the believers arguing, fighting amongst themselves, bring about peace, reformation between the two of them. The word iqtatalu follows this same rule as the word iftitah. When you see two groups fighting, iqtatalu, faslihu baynahuma, bring about reformation with them. The word iqtatalu is a continuous tense. It means when you see two groups of the believers continuously fighting, that is when there is an obligation upon us to step in, bring these two groups together in order to bring about that reformation. But the beauty is that this word iqtatalu specifies continuous argument. For example, if you and I argue once, let's say we've fallen out with a business transaction, we're brothers, we're family members. Sometimes we have a difference of opinion. If you and I argue once, but that's the end of it, it means that there's no need to step in because you and I have concluded our disagreement. We've put it aside, we've moved on. But the Quran specified iqtatalu, when you see them going through continuous arguments, when there's no ending towards our disagreement, that is when someone should step in and be able to say, we will bring about reformation, we will bring about sulh and peace between these two people. The commander of the faithful once brought his two magnificent sons. He said to them, O oh Hassan, O oh Hussein, I will tell you what your grandfather told me. If you see two groups from amongst the believers arguing, bring about reformation, for it is dearer in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the person who fasts and prays mustahabbat for a whole year. Bring about reformation because it is better than these. There is a story of a scholar who took this to the highest of levels. Marhum Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi, may Allah bless his soul. He's buried in holy Karbala. When you go and you stand in front of Qibla and you're facing towards Qibla, if you look immediately left, you will find that his grave is buried there within the compounds of the master of the martyrs. It's once narrated that Sayyid Shirazi as a very senior scholar within the holy city of Qom, there were other scholars that didn't agree with him so much. They, they, they had a falling out. They didn't like his way of thinking. They didn't agree with him. Intellectual differences of opinion happen. He said to himself, I can wait for believers to come and bring me and this other scholarly group together. Or I can take it upon myself to go and sit with that scholar. He called that particular scholar, invited himself home, 
and sat with him. At the end, the scholar came out and said, this is no ordinary marja. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Rida Shirazi is an angel walking upon this earth. That is the level in which someone goes in order to bring about reconciliation. There's a problem between us. I won't wait till he comes and steps in. I will come to you and say, let us separate or let us bring about our reconciliation. The Quran said, اقتتلوا فصله بينهما In the continuous tense. Or as another example, within Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the disbelievers. They would say, قَالُوا أَسَاطِيلُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اِكْتَتَبَهَا The disbelievers would say that these are just stories from the ancients. The Prophet, he's not really bringing wahi. There's no real revelation. It's just stories of the old. He's just regurgitating the stories of Nabi Allah Nuh, Nabi Allah Yusuf and so on and so forth. This same accusation is one that is labeled amongst us today by the other people. They come today and still say that these words are nothing but a regurgitation of the Bible. The Quran quoted the disbelievers in the continuous sense. قَالُوا أَسَاطِيلُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اِكْتَتَبَهَا He does nothing but plagiarize continuously. Whenever we ask him about Yusuf, he says, wait, I will bring you a story. He plagiarizes. When we ask him about Nuh or Dhurqanain, he plagiarizes. These were the continuous tenses that were made within this particular thing. To the point that these continuous tense in the Arabic language denotes that when you actively, continuously perform this action, it becomes habitual for you. When we argue, we continuously argue, it becomes habitual. When the Prophet was accused of, of plagiarism, he was becoming habitual in his plagiarism. Similarly, when we begin with the words, Allahumma inni aftatihu thana'a bihamdik, we say, My Lord, I am praising you so often that it becomes part and parcel of who I am. Wherever I walk, I look around the universe, I say, Praise be to Allah, for I see the stars, He is the Creator. When I see the sea, I see praise be to my Lord for you are the creator of this sea. Whatever, whenever, I am the one who is continuously praising you. And that is what is meant by Allahumma inni aftati hathana abihamdik. My master says, I begin by continuously praising you. It is habitual for me. I can't stop praising you, my Lord. And therefore, this dua is split into two. It follows the same theme. The Imam states, he begins by the praise. Now if the dua is split into two, and the first half is a praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the second half must be an evident praise towards the divine leaders. And that is why in the second half of the dua, the Imam praises Ahlul Bayt in such a manner that you may not have seen elsewhere from any other Imam in his time. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin abdika wa rasulik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin abdika wa rasulik. Wa aminika wa safiyik. Wa habibika wa khiratika min khalkik. Wa hafid sirrika wa muballigh risalatik. Afdala wa ahsana wa ajmala wa akmala wa azka. Wa anma wa atyaba wa aqhara wa asna. Wa akthara ma sallayta wa barakta. Wa tarahamta wa tahannanta wa sallamta. He continues then, he turns towards the commander of the faithful. Allahumma salli ala aliyin amir al-mu'mineen. Wa wasiyi rasul rabbil alameen. Abdika wa waliyika. Wa akhi rasulika wa hajjatika ala khalkik. Wa ayatika al-kubra wa al-naba'i al-adheem. Wa salli ala siddiqati al-tahira. Fatima al-zahra. Allahumma salli ala Allahumma inni aftatih al-thana'a bihamd. I begin this dua in continuous praise, continuous glorification, continuous recognition of the greatness of who is in front of me. And therefore he starts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the second half he concludes with the praise of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. In the end of this first line, Allahumma inni aftatih al-thana'a bihamdik. Al-thana'a and hamd are two different types of glorification and praise. Hamd is superior. And therefore, every type of thana is hamd. But hamd is superior. And therefore, when you give hamd, it is not thana. 
And therefore, the Imam starts by saying, I begin this praise by glorifying you and praising you in such a way. Please raise your hands, join us in da'a. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior. We ask you, Ya Allah, through the wasilah of the Holy Quran and the awaited Savior of our time, to allow us to be alongside Him at all times in our life and in our death. We ask you, Ya Allah, if we are to pass away from this world before the reappearance, raise us from our graves to be alongside our Imam. We ask you, Ya Allah, through the wasilah of the Holy Quran and our wonderful Imam, to allow us to fulfill this month as you have commanded us to fulfill it, to understand and recite Quran as you have obliged us to recite it, to fast as we have been obliged to fast. We ask you, Ya Allah, to forgive the sins of our parents, Amar Humeen, all those whom we love, all those that love us and all of our leaders. And we ask you, Ya Allah, perform the opportunity, have the opportunity to perform the ziyarat of all of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them all. And we ask you, Ya Allah, for the opportunity to die in the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.